Beetlejuice, a red supergiant. This ball of boiling plasma is one of the largest stars in our galaxy, and one of the brightest. It's about 500 times larger than the Sun. But Betelgeuse is pulsating, getting bigger and smaller. At its peak, it becomes 800 times its average size. If this star were a bucket, it would fit about 300 million suns, even though its weight is only 17 times greater. And here, about 500 light years away, is Earth. We launch our faster-than-light spaceship and set off on our journey to Betelgeuse. A few seconds, and we've already traveled 240,000 miles, and now are close to the moon. That's nine and a half trips around the Earth. A traditional rocket-powered spacecraft would take three days to get here. We're near Mars now. The flight to the Red Planet usually takes about seven months. Several rovers are now at work here, as well as the first ever flying drone, Ingenuity. The surface of Mars is three times smaller than that of Earth. The planet is also 10 times lighter. People hope to build a human colony here soon. Right beyond Mars, we have to wiggle and constantly dodge space rocks. This is the asteroid belt. It contains debris and space objects of different sizes and shapes. The biggest of them is Ceres. Its surface is slightly larger than the area of Argentina, and its weight is about 1% of the moon's. The total weight of the entire asteroid belt is 25 times less than the moon's. Next, we pass gas giants Jupiter and Saturn. These are the largest planets in the solar system. They're also the heaviest, even though they don't have a solid surface. Then, we travel by Uranus and Neptune. They're called ice giants. And at the very edge of the solar system, we see Pluto. It was once considered a full-fledged planet, but now it's not even on the list. After that, we're 4.3 billion miles away from our home. It took the New Horizons space probe about nine years to get here. Hold on to your seat. We are speeding up. We're passing through the Kuiper Belt. There are lots of asteroids and blocks of ice here. These are some of the oldest building materials in our solar system. Billions of years ago, our whole world looked like a cloud of these asteroids. We're traveling further through dark space and reach the edge of the solar system, the heliosphere. All this time, we've been moving with the solar wind. But now, it starts to slow down, collides with the interstellar wind, and heats up. This is called the termination shock. The Voyager 1 space probe got to this point in December 2004. We're moving to the region where the heliosphere ends and interstellar space begins. This is the heliopause. In 2012, Voyager crossed this boundary and became the first ever human-made object in interstellar space. But the message from Voyager reporting this event came to Earth almost a year later because of the huge distance. It took 35 years for Voyager 1 to travel all this way. And here it is. The probe is as long as a car and weighs like two motorcycles. You can see a gold plate on its hull. It's a message from people to potential civilizations out there. It has pictures of Earth's landscapes, recordings of human speech, and our DNA. As of 2021, Voyager has been operational for almost 43 years. The probe has traveled 14 billion miles. That's like 152 Earth to the Sun distances. And it's still making its way through space at 38,000 miles per hour. Now, we're approaching the nearest star to our solar system. It's Proxima Centauri. We're so far from home that even light needs more than four years to travel this distance. If we used a traditional rocket, the trip would take us 73,000 years. The reason we wanted to get here was because of an Earth-like planet called Proxima Centauri b. It's 10% larger than Earth and slightly heavier. It lies in the habitable zone of its host star. It means that water might exist on the planet in its liquid state, and there can be life that forms here. But the star itself occasionally produces flares. Recently, its brightness increased almost 1,000 times. During that time, it emitted so much radiation that even if there were some forms of life on the planet, they probably ceased to exist. We're now more than eight light years away from Earth. The brightest star in our night sky is Sirius. Seriously. It's so bright that you can see it even during the day. But in reality, there are actually two stars, Sirius A and B. They orbit around a common center of gravity. And these stars are moving toward our solar system at almost five miles per second. 
That's the same as the maximum speed of a top-of-the-line supercar on Earth. Foot down, and we've arrived at a potentially habitable planet 39 light-years away from Earth. This is TRAPPIST-1D. Its host star is a white dwarf. It's a cold star, 10 times smaller and lighter than the Sun. There are seven planets around it, but TRAPPIST-1D is the most similar to Earth. It's only 30% smaller and three times lighter. But it has a rocky surface, and the temperature here is 48 degrees Fahrenheit. You'd feel comfortable here wearing a light jacket. There might be an atmosphere, mountains, seas, and oceans here. Which means this planet might be suitable for a human colony. But it would take about 677,000 years to get here using traditional rockets. And here's our main goal, Betelgeuse. It'd take nearly 8.7 million years to travel here from Earth in a current day spacecraft. This star is so big that our ship looks like a grain of sand on a giant beach. We have to jump back in time to find out what happened to this star. First, there was a beautiful nebula. It's a cloud of multicolored space dust and debris. Then, it began to shrink under its own weight. In the core of the nebula, a nuclear reaction began. Boom! And the star was born. At first, Betelgeuse was very massive and hot, but it didn't expand and remained stable. Let's look into its heart. The nuclear reactions in the star's core create a lot of heat and energy. This energy produces the force that pushes on the walls of the star from the inside and causes it to expand. But at the same time, the star is very heavy. That's why gravity pushes on it from the outside. If these two forces are balanced, the star remains stable. But over time, the star runs out of its fuel, helium and hydrogen. That's when heavier elements in the core join the nuclear reaction. When they burn, they release more energy and heat than gravity can hold, and the star starts expanding. That's what's happening to Betelgeuse right now. It's already so big that if you put it in the center of our solar system, its edge would touch the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Betelgeuse will continue to expand until it exhausts its fuel completely. Then the gravity will win. The star will shrink in size, and then an enormous boom will happen. A supernova explosion will be so blinding that Betelgeuse will shine brighter than the moon in the night sky. Luckily, Earth is too far away for this explosion to cause any harm to people. A strong stream of matter that will be ejected from the explosion site won't reach the solar system until 6 million years later. Even so, the solar wind will stop this flow, so we'll be safe. Betelgeuse is likely to explode at any time in the next 10,000 years. But some scientists say it won't happen in the next 100 millennia. Back to the moment before the explosion of Betelgeuse, there can be another, more interesting scenario. Gravity might compress the massive core of the star with such force that a black hole will appear in its place. Black holes are the heaviest objects in the universe. They have incredible gravitational force. Even light can't escape their gravitational trap. The Betelgeuse black hole will begin feeding on cosmic dust and whatever is left of the star. All this debris and light from other stars will get frozen near the event horizon of the growing black hole. For the first time in history, we'll be able to watch the birth of this mysterious object. But in reality, Betelgeuse is too light to become a black hole. Most likely, after the explosion, it'll turn into a white dwarf that will gradually fade until it becomes invisible. A recent study claims that the moon has a tail, and every month it wraps around our planet like a scarf. A slender tail made up of millions of atoms of sodium follows Earth's natural satellite, and our planet regularly travels directly through it. Meteor strikes blast these sodium atoms out of the moon's surface and further into space. For several days every month, the moon remains between the sun and our planet. That's when Earth's gravity picks up that sodium tail. Our planet drags it into a long stripe that wraps around its atmosphere. This lunar tail is totally harmless. It's also invisible to the human eye, 50 times dimmer than what you can perceive. But during those rare days, high-powered telescopes can spot its faint yellowish glow in the sky. The tail looks like a gleaming spot that's five times the full moon's diameter. Mathematicians claim white holes might exist. Unfortunately, scientists haven't found one yet. Even if you saw a white hole, 
you wouldn't be able to enter it from the outside, but you'd notice light and matter leaving it. Betelgeuse, a red giant in the Orion constellation, started to dim in 2019. This confused astronomers. By that time, the star had already swollen to enormous proportions. If it was to replace our sun, its outer surface would spread far beyond Jupiter's orbit. And then Betelgeuse became dimmer in the fall of 2019. This process continued through February 2020. The changes could already be seen with the unaided eye. No wonder, the star's brightness had dipped by two-thirds. At that time, astronomers were sure Betelgeuse was about to explode into a supernova. They continued to observe the star, but unexpectedly, it returned to its regular brightness in April. Thanks to the Hubble Space Telescope, scientists figured out that the star had ejected some of its material, and this partially blocked its light. Our Milky Way galaxy and the Andromeda galaxy, our closest neighbor, are going to meet. But it'll happen in about 4 billion years. When they collide, an enormous elliptical galaxy will be formed. There might be more water on the moon than scientists thought before. And not only on its dark side, but also its sunlit side. This water is likely to come in handy during the already planned missions in the future. Cotton candy exoplanets are particular planets outside of our solar system. Also called super puffs, they have the lowest density ever discovered. This gives them an airy, fluffy appearance. But despite looking like the most popular amusement park treat, these planets are enormous. The Juno mission has noticed something weird in the upper atmosphere of Jupiter. The unusual phenomenon was blue sprites and elves twirling above the planet. These are two kinds of bright flashes of light that appear for short periods of time, mere milliseconds. They extend up and down toward the surface of the planet. On Earth, such flashes usually happen at a height of 60 miles above massive thunderstorms. In the universe, there are not only dwarf planets, but also dwarf galaxies. They have from 1,000 to a few billion stars. For comparison, the Milky Way galaxy is made up of 250 to 400 billion stars. A storm the size of our planet keeps raging on Saturn. It's called the Great White Spot. The storm has a tail of white clouds, and it encircles the entire planet. The storm occurs every 30 years or so, when Saturn's northern hemisphere tilts toward the sun. At first, the storm is indeed just a spot, and then it starts stretching in length. That's because the Great White Spot is a huge system of thunderstorms. But the main mystery puzzling astronomers is where the storm gets its energy from. Some scientists think it might be powered by the sun. Others disagree. And they say the storm's cloud pattern only makes sense if there's an internal heat source that can power the winds. Rogue planets don't orbit their stars, maybe because they don't have any. These free-floating space bodies travel across the universe and can end up literally anywhere. They're also very hard to find. Rogue planets don't produce light. Neither do they emit heat, which means they can't be seen in infrared light. But not so long ago, astronomers spotted the smallest rogue planet in the Milky Way. It's smaller than Earth, but a bit bigger than Mars. The moon seems to be shrinking. Earth's natural satellite is now 150 feet smaller than it used to be hundreds of millions of years ago. The reason for this phenomenon might be the cooling of the moon's insides. It could also explain the quakes shaking the surface of our planet's natural satellite. Astronomers have recently found out that Mars is seismically active. Mars quakes occur there on a regular basis. Scientists often discover strange things in space. Many of them look like blurry blobs. But there's one type of these blobs that doesn't look like any other known space body. The odd radio circles are only visible in radio telescopes. They aren't the remains of supernovae or a bizarre optical effect. Some astronomers go as far as to claim that they might be the throats of wormholes. Those are hypothetical tunnels between black holes. Fast radio bursts are blindingly bright bursts of radio waves. They pack as much energy as our sun produces in days, but last for mere milliseconds. Most of these fast radio bursts came from far, far beyond the Milky Way. But recently, astronomers have detected some originating in our home galaxy, and their source was a magnetar, just 30,000 light years away from our planet. Any liquid floating in outer space forms itself into a sphere. This phenomenon also occurs in low Earth orbit. Not so long ago, scientists discovered that one of the most massive stars in the neighborhood just 
disappeared. It was a star 75 million light years away from Earth. Normally, it'd be too far away for astronomers to clearly see individual stars, but only unless they're huge. And the star we're talking about was enormous. It was shining 2.5 million times brighter than the sun. Astronomers saw the star for the last time in 2011. They decided to examine it more closely several years later, but it was already too late. The star had vanished. Such massive stars usually go out in an extremely bright supernova, but astronomers noticed nothing like that in this case. There's a theory that the star collapsed into a black hole without triggering a supernova first. It does occur among stars approaching the end of their lives, but very, very rarely. In billions of years, the universe is likely to expand so much that we won't be able to see any stars in the sky. All planets in the solar system emit radio waves. They're especially strong if we talk about Jupiter. This planet has the biggest and most powerful magnetic field. But astronomers couldn't detect any radio waves coming from a planet outside the solar system. That is until 2020. The signal scientists recorded came from a gas giant, Tau Budis. It's 51 light years away from our planet. Thanks to this signal, astronomers managed to find out a bit about the planet's magnetic field. And in the future, this will help to learn more about what's happening in the planet's atmosphere. Dwarf planet Haumea is further from Earth than Neptune. It's orbiting in the Kuiper Belt. That's a donut-shaped ring of ice objects circling the Sun. Elongated Haumea has two moons. A day on this dwarf planet lasts four Earth hours. All in all, this space body is rather bizarre. It's surrounded by thin rings that likely appeared as the result of an ancient collision. A star in the galaxy GSN 069 is likely to turn into a planet the size of Jupiter in the next trillion years. It might happen because of the star's regular encounters with a black hole. First, astronomers noticed unusual X-ray bursts that were strangely bright. They went off every nine hours. After studying this phenomenon for some time, the scientists realized it was a star moving in a unique orbit around a black hole. The dazzling flashes? It was the material getting slurped off the star's surface by the black hole. It turned out that over millions of years, the black hole had already transformed the red giant into a white dwarf. And the process isn't going to stop whatsoever. Astronomers have found some traces of phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus. On our planet, this gas, colorless and flammable, is often found where microbes live. No wonder a new theory suggests there might be life on Venus. But even if there was some life on the evening star, it could have only appeared in its atmosphere. Probably no living organism would be able to survive the planet's extreme environment. Venus's surface is extremely dry. There's no liquid water on the planet, and the pressure there is 90 times greater than that on Earth's surface. The temperatures often rise higher than 900 degrees Fahrenheit. That's hot enough to melt some metals. Today, we're going to work our core, so get ready to sweat. Oops, sorry, wrong core. Hey, we've traveled far and wide, down to the Earth's inner core and up into outer space. But what if we could combine these adventures and find out what hides in the innards of other planets and moons in the solar system? With the help of this interstellar hyperdrill, we can achieve that, at least in part. Coordinates are in, all systems ready, and our first destination is… the Moon. Our Moon, in fact. We land on its gray and desolate surface under the black sky. No blue here, because there's very little atmosphere to disperse the light. The drill starts working, and we first go through the outer layer of the Moon, the crust, just like on Earth. We're on the sunny side, so the thickness of this layer is only 43 miles. But were we to land on the dark side, it would be more than twice as thick. The Moon is a rocky body, so its crust is largely made of silicon, iron, aluminum, calcium, oxygen, and magnesium, with much smaller amounts of other elements. Further down, we find the mantle, and it's a long and tenuous journey through. This layer is about 850 miles thick. It gets hotter as we go deeper, finding composite minerals, pyroxene and olivine. They're made of iron, silicon, oxygen, and magnesium in different proportions. Finally, we break through the hard layers and into the semi-molten outer core. Another journey of about 93 miles ahead through this scalding swamp. 
And we dive into the iron ocean of the liquid core shell. It's nearly 60 miles thick, and the molten metal threatens to evaporate us. But this drill was made to sustain an extremely heavy onslaught. And that's how we finally come to a sudden halt. In the deepest reaches of the moon, there's a solid iron core, which is 150 miles thick. We could drill through it, but it would be unnecessary. So we just set the flag here and skip to the next planet on our drilling list. And it's Mercury! It was hot deep inside the moon, but on the surface of the smallest planet in the system, it's even hotter. That's because it's so close to the sun, of course. Alright, let's drill. Mercury has a pretty thick outer shell, which is both crust and mantle, going about 250 miles deep. Not the most fascinating journey, it's not unlike the Earth in many respects. But then, the drill stops, ramming into a solid metal wall. It's Mercury's core, which has a diameter of over 2,500 miles. It takes up to 85% of the planet's overall diameter. No use trying to drill through this one. It's fully metal and extremely dense. Skipping to the next planet, and we're on Mars now. Oh look, it's sunset here, and the sun is making the sky hazy blue. But you know the drill. I mean, we're here to drill. So that's what we do. Mars's crust is quite thin compared to Earth's, just 6 to 30 miles deep. Its composition is much the same, though. Iron, aluminum, calcium, potassium, and magnesium. That's one of the reasons why humans are looking to colonize the red planet one day. It's very similar to our own. We're very quick to drill through the first layer, and the second one, the mantle, is now upon us. It's a hard and rocky layer about 1,100 miles thick. Thanks to its size, Mars isn't seismically active any longer. There's simply no magma boiling close underneath the surface of the planet, making it silent and docile. It's a long dig, but we finally come to a screeching halt, bumping into the core. A ball of iron, nickel, and sulfur with a diameter of 2,000 to 2,600 miles. This core is bigger than that of Mercury, but the planet itself is larger too, so it figures. Okay then, our next stop is even more interesting, because it's… Jupiter. This gas giant has a mass twice that of all the other planets in the solar system combined. And we landed right in the middle of an ocean. The ocean, I dare say, it's the largest one in the whole system, and it's made of liquid hydrogen. The drill goes smoothly through the surface of the planet, because there's no rock or hard metal here, only gas and liquid. But the shaking, yikes! The pressure on this planet is more than just huge, it's unimaginable. The drill is barely able to withstand it, and as it's going deeper, the pressure's becoming higher too. We've reached Jupiter's core, and it's nearly too much to bear. The temperature here is about 90,000 degrees Fahrenheit, and the core itself is not solid but liquid as well, kept together by the immense pressure from all sides. The drill starts to rattle. Bad sign. Let's get out of here before it breaks. Whew. No winds, no pressure, no heat. All around us is a vast icy wasteland, crisscrossed by ridges and reddish bands. It's Europa, one of Jupiter's most promising moons. As we drill through the ice, let me explain. Europa is one of the candidates to have extraterrestrial life in the solar system. And it can be found right beneath the icy shell through which we're now digging. It's only 10 to 15 miles thick, while down below is an enormous saltwater ocean, twice bigger than all of Earth's oceans combined. The deepest point on Earth is Challenger Deep, and it's a bit over 6 miles down. The ocean on Europa, on the other hand, can be up to 100 miles deep. Who knows what can be lurking in that deep, dark sea? Anyway, we travel fast through the water and finally reach the bottom of the ocean. The mantle starts here, and it's made of rock, just like on Earth. And not much deeper in, we find the metal core of the moon. Europa is a little smaller than Earth's moon, so it's no surprise we reach its center pretty fast. Okay, skip drive on, let's go further. Oh, I'd rather we drill in as fast as we can. Just look around, it's blazing here. We're definitely on Io, another moon of Jupiter, and the most volcanically active world in the solar system. Look, that volcano is twice the size of Everest, and it's erupting right now. Thankfully, we're under Io's surface already. But that's not to say we're safe. It's all molten down here too, mostly yellow and brownish hue due to the huge amounts of sulfur. 
the stench must be horrible. Anyway, the most peculiar feature is that both inside and outside, everything's always on the move on EO. Jupiter and its other moons create tremendous tidal forces, making the surface of EO swell over 300 feet up and down. Like the largest tsunamis on Earth, only here it's not water but rock. The deeper we go, the calmer it gets, though, until we're finally at the iron core. It's still hot here, but at least there's no shaking and swelling like above. Let's put up another flag and go to the next point. And that would be Saturn! The second largest planet of the solar system, and the one best known for its spectacular rings. Not the only one to have them at all, mind you, but we'll get to it. Now, as you've surely noticed, our drill is simply falling down through the gaseous hydrogen and helium, making up most of the planet's surface and atmosphere. No need to work here. Just wait and hope the immense pressure won't crush our drill to a hunk of junk. At last, the pressures become so enormous that we find ourselves in the liquid hydrogen, and here we start diving. Soon we'll reach the solid core of Saturn. Ah, here we are. It's made of iron and nickel and is actually quite small compared to the rest of the planet. Well, the last destination awaits, so come on! And here we come, Neptune. The drill immediately deploys anchors, because the winds here are extremely powerful. They reach speeds five times greater than the most devastating hurricanes on Earth. Neptune is covered in a pretty thin layer of hydrogen and helium, just like Saturn or Jupiter. But underneath, there's much more than that. It's hot, windy, and lonely here on the outskirts of the solar system. So let's dig already. Beneath the gases, there's suddenly a bubbling hot mass of water, methane, and ammonia. Pew! These substances are hot, despite Neptune being called an ice giant. The name comes from its core. Deep inside, where we're quickly headed right now, a small ball of rock and ice sits all alone. And despite the boiling temperatures above, the ice beneath is ever cold. 